Hi everyone, it's me, Adrienne Lee, the Wandering Art Historian, back with another video in our series, How to Read a Painting. As you know, we're in the midst of, of a deep dive into the study of color in art. And what I'm about to tell you is gonna maybe sound a little crazy, but this entire video is gonna be dedicated to the color blue, which may be the most important, significant color in all of art history. Now, I never like to make absolute statements and even saying that is an absolute statement. However, I think after the course of watching this video, you're gonna see how important the color blue is, not only to artists, but to the different cultures who thrive on the art created by these artists, okay? Um, let's start with this idea that Blue is a big part of our everyday lives, right? We have Blue Man Group. Um, we also have, oh, we used to have the Blue Light Special, right? Oh, not, not so much anymore. Did you know that Blue Light um, possesses, um, it controls our response to the portion of the spectrum and sets our circadian rhythm, which helps us go to sleep at night. Blue light does that. And that everyone, even non-sighted people, still have special receptors in their eyes that sense blue light. That's fascinating, but it's also why we can't fall asleep after looking at um, our screens for a long time because the technology is also emitting blue light all day, every day, and all we do is look at screens so it throws everything off. Ha <laughs> ha, blue light, did you know that? I know, it's fascinating. Um, the Celts famously painted themselves blue before going into battle, and the ancient Romans thought they were the barbaric ones. And that's just hilarious to me. Um, we also have blue collar workers, but we also wear blue jeans. And everyone wears blue jeans. Us common people, celebrities, it doesn't matter who, right? What's very cool is that Hindu gods are often blue. Krishna, Shiva, Rama, they're depicted with blue skin as a reference to the infinite or a heavenly blue, and I think that's really cool. The symbol for the United Nations is blue, specifically as the opposite of the color of war, which, if you guessed, is the color red, you would be correct. Electric blue um, is often associated with electricity, technology, modernity. Um, but here's the very interesting thing, is there's actually not a lot of blue in nature. Think about it. You may have blueberries, bluebells, a couple of bluish flowers, a couple of blue birds, but that's about it. Except for two really huge parts of nature, and if you think about it, it makes sense, the sky and the ocean, right? Now what's really cool is that scholars b believed that the ancient Greeks were colorblind because they had no word for the color blue. But that's because they just didn't see blue in nature enough to have a word for it. How awesome is that, right? Um, what does Kandinsky think of the color blue? Remember, he had very strong feelings about the color yellow, right? The power of profound meaning is found in blue. Well, we're off to a good start. Blue is the typical heavenly color. The ultimate feeling it creates is one of rest. Hmm, interesting. Supernatural rest, not the earthly contentment of green. The way to the supernatural lies through the natural, and we mortals passing from the earthly yellow to the heavenly blue must pass through green. Interesting. In music, a light blue is like a flute, a darker blue, a cello, a still darker and thunderous double bass, and the darkest blue of all, an organ. I have a feeling that Kandinsky really likes the color blue. What do you think? Right? Well, let's start looking at blue throughout art history. I've already shown you a couple of frescoes by this artist, Giotto, um, that date around 1305. Um, they, uh, these frescoes are located in the Scrovani Chapel in Padua, Italy. 
And what I really want you to notice, and what you're probably noticing already, are the ceilings are this intense, incredible, bright blue. Yes, we're starting to see blue painted on ceilings to represent the heavens, where the divine lives, right? Pretty powerful. Look at these minarets. Um, the, this is in Sergeyev Posad in Russia. It's about a day trip outside of Moscow. Um, these for our date around 1585. But look at how stunning these minarets are in that bright blue. Um, and the shape always pointing to the heavens. What it looks like in winter and spring and summer. And how they just stand out and point to the divine very powerful. A lot of it has to do with how this blue color was made into a pigment for paint. And that's where we need to talk about lapis lazuli. Okay, um, The earliest pieces of lapis lazuli came from what is now Afghanistan, and then they went to Venice, Italy to be crushed and turned into paint. Okay, um, And it would be cheaper in Venice because that was the home home base, so it would spread out from there. But think about this. It's already coming from Afghanistan, and it actually takes more than two weeks to crush this mineral into a fine enough powder to mix it with a medium to get it into a, 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 a workable paint that is making it very expensive, right? So the further away you get from Venice, the more expensive it gets, which is why if you look at the art of the Renaissance in Northern Europe, you don't see as much of this mesmerizing blue because it would be even more expensive to get it the further away you get from Venice. That makes sense, right? However, the process was worth it because pe these artists became mesmerized. They became bewitched, hypnotized by this incredible Blue it was so luminous and so vibrant. It was wildly expensive because it traveled a long way and it took a long time to make. So you start to think, maybe I, I save this color for the most important paintings or the most important figures in paintings, right? Let's put a pin in it for a second because we're gonna come back to that idea. But this color, blue is so powerful. It, 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 it can't be limited to just the Middle Ages or the Renaissance. Let's go into modern art for a hot minute. Because Picasso famously had his blue period. Here we have this incredible painting of the old guitarist. This dates to around 1903-1904. And Picasso's blue period came about because of a terrible thing that happened. Um, his best friend, Carlos Casagemas, they went to um, Paris to study art together, and Casagames had some mental health issues and attempted to murder his girlfriend and then turned the gun on himself and committed suicide. It's a terrible story, and it sent Picasso, who's like 19, 20, 21 years at this time, of age at this time, into a deep depression thus resulting in his blue period. And if you look at this particular painting, it's the epitome of this time period in Picasso's life. And what makes this particular painting so profound? When you look at it, you realize blue is almost the only color used. Do you notice that? Even the gentleman himself is shades of blue with hints of white. And the only thing that stands out is the brown of this guitar, right? And you might even describe this particular painting as uh, kind of depressing, sad, uh, dark, a lot of kind of negative feelings and emotions. Um, it currently resides at the Art Institute of Chicago, and that's what it looks like. Um, in the gallery space, so that blue really stands out. Oh, it's a very emotional piece. Um, now, it, blue is not necessarily a negative color for every artist. Um, this is not a paint chip. It's not a Pantone color. 
Um, it's an actual painting by um, artist Yves Klein. Uh, it dates around 1962, and Eve Klein was an artist who was obsessed with the color blue. And that's not an exaggeration. He actually spent a good chunk of his professional career as an artist in search of the perfect blue. He actually worked with scientists and chemists to patent what he believed to be the perfect, perfect color blue, and that's what you're seeing right here. He patented it, patented it, International Klein Blue, IKB. And what we're looking at here is his painting IKB 191 from 1962. So he set out to not only create this perfect blue and patent it, but he used it again and again and again in his artwork. Um, check out this painting. Does anyone recognize this artist? This is the artist Maxfield Parrish. Um, he was an American artist. This is his painting Daybreak from 1922. And the way in which Maxfield Parrish used the color blue and his artwork became so profound and so significant that people started referring to it as Parrish blue. And for Maxfield Parrish, he often used this color blue in paintings of fantasy lands or fairy tales or utopias. And we often see young people uh, a lot, almost like a Neverland, if you will, where you never age and you're young and beautiful forever. Here are two more images. Um, a survey of art print publishers at the time of Maxfield Parrish revealed that the three favorite artists of their um, clients were Cezanne, Van Gogh, and Maxfield Parrish. And I think that's pretty good company to be in. By 1925, one out of every four households in the U.S. had a copy of one of his art prints hanging on their walls. Just as a testament that not only are artists drawn to the color blue, but us regular old human beings are drawn to the color blue. I included this image here on the left because it does have a connection to central Florida, which is where these videos are shot. Um, this particular image is located in, a, um, in the collection of a local museum, the Morse Museum in Winter Park, Florida. It's Dinky Bird from around 1904. Pretty cool, huh? Now, remember when I said that because the color's blue, you know, in the Middle Ages and during the Renaissance was coming from a long distance and it took a long time to make and that kind of drives the, the price of this paint color up, we start to think maybe we should start reserving it just for the most important paintings or the most important figures in paintings. And I gotta say, I put this painting together for you to see, see if you could figure out who we're reserving the color blue for. This is one panel of the Wilton Diptych from around 1395, where we see who the Virgin Mary, dressed completely in blue, holding Jesus, who is in a stunning golden robe. Amazing, right? Look at all of the angels that surround her. Remember, the blue angels are the cherubim. They are the ones that accompany the Virgin Mary to heaven at the end of her dorm mission, right? So we're noticing about 12th century, the color blue becomes increasingly more divine and associated with the Virgin Mary. Um, and that's, remember our guide Jer uh, Jerome that we talked about in a previous video? how he said, hey, maybe we start venerating the Virgin Mary and giving her a bit more credit. And people were like, yeah, that's cool, let's do it. They did it through the use of the color blue, the single most expensive color to create outside of gold leaf, right? Awesome, okay. Um, let's look at this particular painting. I included it because I really wanna take a moment to read it with you, okay? Because color plays a big role. This is the entire painting in its final destination of the San Zaccaria altarpiece. It's from about 1505, it's by Bellini. Um, and I put a detail over here because I really want us to take a second to look at the use of color. So let's go have a look. 
we're gonna start with this gentleman right here on the left, okay? Now he's in a blue cloak covered over, or maybe tunic might be the best word for that, and a yellow cloak wrapped around, and he's holding a book, and in his hand, it may be difficult to see, but he's holding keys. Now if I told you this was a saint, who do you think that might be? If you said Saint Peter, you would be correct. He's holding the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He's the one who's waiting for us at the pearly gates, right? And he has the blue associated with the divine and the spiritual. But again, remember he's wearing that yellow cloak that we saw in our video on the color yellow. Because remember, he still denied Christ, which is like a betrayal, right? Now here on the far right, here we have this gentleman, older fella, reading his books, totally engrossed like a scholar would be, but completely in red, almost like a cardinal of the Catholic Church. Does anyone remember who that saint is? That's our buddy, Saint Jerome, one of the four Latin fathers of the Catholic Church. He was the guy that said, let's turn, let's uh, take the books of the Bible and translate them into Latin. That's called the Vulgate. But he's also the guy that said, let's start giving the Virgin Mary more credit. So of course he is included in this scene. Now what's interesting is if we go to the middle, here we have this amazing throne with a lady and a baby. And I know what you're thinking. Well, obviously that's the Virgin Mary holding baby Jesus, kind of sitting on a throne like a queen would. But you're like, wait a second, all of these, who are all these people? Well, this would be called a sacred conversation because it's depicting the Virgin Mary and Jesus with saints from all of history hanging out, okay? So that's what that means. And do we notice that she's got the red of humanity covered over by the blue of divinity and a very interesting white to kind of emphasize her purity and holiness, right? Um, we've got two nice ladies hanging out here and um, let's talk about them for a second. Their uh, clue to the fact that they are also saints is that they're holding these palm fronds. Do you see the palm fronds right here? Yeah, that's typically a symbol of a saint who has been martyred. And yes, both of these ladies were killed because of their faith. Um, this lady right here, she's got her hand on a piece of wood and it's a broken wheel. And what that means is she was tortured on a wheel yeah, very medieval, very terrifying and terrible. And that makes this lady Saint Catherine. Now remember, in our previous videos, we said that sometimes a symbol or an attribute of a saint is the thing that murdered them. And in this case, Saint Catherine's symbol is a, is a wheel. Yeah, rough, I know. Um, who's this nice lady then? Well, it can be a little bit tricky to see, but she's holding a jar in her hand. Yeah, do you know where I'm going with this? Inside this jar are her eyeballs. Yes. Um, so <laughs> what we have here is a, a saint who was tortured. They pulled out her eyes. That makes it Saint Lucy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And if you're wondering who this little lady is and why the perspective on her, the proportions are not quite right with her and her instrument. We, we believe that this is a little angel here, okay? So here we've used color to decipher, help decipher who these figures are along with their symbols. And you're doing a great job. Do you remember way back when we looked at this painting? I wanted to bring it up again. Uh, the workshop of Robert Compton, the master of Flamal, as we used to call him, the Maraud altarpiece. And remember we said that this was telling the story of the Annunciation, right? And we said, okay, these are the donors. These are the people that paid for the artwork to be created. They get to appear in the altarpiece because they gave the money. Um, and then we said, look at Joseph over there. He's in his workshop. And here we have our angel and the Virgin Mary. Let's now look at how the colors are used, specifically the color blue. And that the angel, Angel Gabriel, is in these beautiful shades of blue, definitely emphasizing 
the divine and the spiritual as opposed to the earthly and the human, do we notice the Virgin Mary is completely in red? And remember how red is our human color, the blood of humanity, right? However, she leans on a prayer bench that is upholstered in what color? Blue. She's quite literally leaning on her faith. She's leaning on the divine. And I think that's a very interesting choice by the artist because remember, this was the guy that painted tiny baby flying Jesus holding a cross, signifying that of course she's purely human. She has not been impregnated yet. She has, she's not carrying uh, the savior yet as a child, you know, as a child, so she is still purely human. I think that's a really cool choice by the artist. And if you look at Joseph here on the far right, do you notice he's wearing a brown tunic, but the red peeks out around his hands, emphasizing his humanity. And instead of a halo, he wears a blue turban, referencing that he will soon be a saint, Saint Joseph, Jesus' stepdad, right? That's pretty cool. Um, we're going to end this particular video with a very powerful piece by one of my favorites, Titian, okay? Uh, this dates around 1516, 1518, and it's a scene from the life of the Virgin Mary that I've kind of referenced where she's assumed up to heaven, where the angels carry her body. Remember, she doesn't die. She goes into a deep sleep called a dormition, and then angels come and carry her to heaven. That is her assumption. She's assumed into heaven. Um, but what's very cool is that we're also seeing her being crowned, this is her coronation, as the queen of heaven. And what we have here, if you notice, a painting broken down into sec segments. Do you notice that? Different sections. So let us do a little bit of reading here, paying special attention to the use of color, okay? So let's start down here on the ground. If you count these heads, you're like, that's interesting, there's 12 dudes hanging out down here. And if you're like, why are there 12 dudes down there? Well, who would those be? Those would be the 12 apostles. Now, at this point in the story, Judas has already killed himself and he's been replaced. Um, so there are 12 gentlemen down here. However, um, when their backs are to us and we don't really see their faces, it's kind of, they're kind of not as important. The, the ones we really want to look at are the ones that are facing us. And that's um, very much this gentleman right here. Do you notice that he's completely in red, but he's making this, and he has like a very youthful face and long hair. And he's kind of like, Oh, he's looking up at the Virgin, kind of like pondering this amazing event. And we see this figure in religious artworks time and time again, again, making this pose. And I want to ask you, do you think you know who that might be? That is John the Beloved. Okay, that's one of Jesus's best friends. Remember when Jesus died, he was like, mother, take your son, son to, and basically entrusting the care of his mom to his friend, John. John the Beloved becomes John the Evangelist, the guy that ends up on the Isle of Patmos and writes Revelation. So that's that guy. But he's often depicted young and caring for the Virgin Mary as if she was his own mother. Pretty cool, right? And then we see this gentleman right here. Now, we're not 100% sure who this guy is, but do you notice he's in red head to toe as well? And his back is to us, but look at what his arms are doing. They're pointing up and they're pointing at Mary. Interesting, right? Now, here we have this whole slew of angels right on uh, this cloud system here and they're carrying her up and she's again in completely red the human color but wrapped in blue the divine color showing mary is a little bit of both right and that's why she was chosen um, to be the mother of jesus and where are these angels carrying her well look at this beautiful yellow gold area 
That's the heavens. That's heaven. And who is waiting for her? God the Father. Do you notice he's got a little hint of red on his cloak? And the angels have flown in with the crown that they will put on Mary and crown her queen of heaven. Now, what's very interesting about this piece is how Titian has laid it out into segments, okay? So we've got all of our humans down here, right? And we've got Mary here in the middle transitioning from human to divine so that she can be crowned queen of heaven by God the Father, the most divine, right? How awesome is that? And look at this. I don't know if you notice this, but how Titian uses the color red with John here and this guy here, do you notice that it creates a triangle pointing up to God the Father who has a little bit of red on his cloak. Awesome, right? But what's the real kicker here is this, this blue sky. This is what divides the humans from the divine, this beautiful blue sky that Titian has used to kind of guide our eye through this scene. Really cool, right? Ugh, don't you just love art history? I do, I hope you do too. Well, this is the last video for our discussion on color. Um, I hope you're having a good time. I'm having a good time. What's next? Symbols. Yes, the next few videos are gonna be dedicated to symbols. Sometimes when you look at a painting, um, a piece of art, the symbols are hidden in plain sight. You can, you can, figure those paintings out real quickly. They're the ones where it's like, there's a lot of stuff jammed into a painting and all that's intentional and deliberate. And each one of those objects has a, a meaning behind it. So we're gonna look at a few of those, but then we're also gonna look at specific symbols in art. The wheel, the fish, the snake, the apple, and the bull or ox or any bovine creature. Thank you so much for watching yet another video um, if you could um, donate a dollar or two to my virtual tip jar, that would be amazing and I would be so, so grateful. If not, like the videos, share the videos, subscribe to my YouTube channel, all of that helps. I hope you're having fun. I'm having fun. Um, I'll see you next time with another video. Thank you so much.